today I think it's going to be the last day we really get to play with play with some toys here. Um, we're going to move on, finish up chapter five in the next lecture, and then probably move on to, to chapter six. So today what I'd like to talk about are meso compounds. And before we get into that, I'll say a couple of words about the midterm exam. So I know it's a hard exam. Uh, I know we went over a lot of good content. For those of you who are interested in roughly how you did, the mean was a 52, standard deviation was a 19. And what I think that to mean is that a 52 is about a C plus. If you get about 19 more than that, about a 71 is a B plus. That's roughly a B plus. If you get about 19 worse than that, about 33, that would be a B plus. That will give you some calibration in terms of how you're doing. And remember, for the quizzes, I said that 10 is roughly an A, 8 and 9 is B range, 6 and 7 is C range. So you have a pretty good idea of how you're doing in the course. All right. Well, let's talk. Let's talk about meso compounds. And this is a this is a fun topic because stereochemistry really is something that makes us think. And the molecules we're going to be talking about today are going to tease our brains in some new and different ways, just as enantiomers and diastereomers did. And as I said, we'll also get to play with some toys. All right. So meso compounds are compounds that contain two or more asymmetric atoms. Coming back. 
Then I'm going to take the same five member ring structure and I'll throw the hydroxy groups back and have the hydrogens coming out. Then I'm going to go ahead, just like I did with the methyl cyclopentanol, now I'll permute this stereocenter, leave this one alone. So I'll permute the top one, leave the bottom one alone. And this type of systematic thinking to try to, first when you're thinking about a molecule, write out all the structures, this is the same strategy that I used in the heptane problem on the exam. That was one where I said I had to scratch my head initially where I was doing how do you get seven, how do you get nine isomers. I mentioned that in class a couple of weeks ago. And I just went through and permuted specifically, per permuted uh, systematically. And that's what we're doing here. And finally, on our cyclopentane diol example, I'll flip both of the stereocenters. Remember, when you swap the two substituents on a stereocenter, you invert the stereocenter. So by swapping the OH and the hydrogen here, I've inverted this stereocenter. By swapping the OH and the hydrogen here, now I'm inverting this other stereocenter. And then for the sake of talking about these four drawings, I'm going to refer to the first drawing as A, the next drawing as B, third is C, and the fourth is D. And what I'd like to do first is to name all of these compounds. And what's great is since I know that we're systematically swapping the stereocenters, I can just take any one of the compounds, figure out the Conningal prelog stereochemistry, the RRS stereochemistry, for the two stereocenters, and then I'll know all the others as long as I keep track of things. So let's do that. I'll just take compound A over here. <coughs> And so my drawing doesn't get too busy. I'm going to focus first on the stereo center on top. I'll put a little asterisk over next to it just to remind me that we're focusing first on the one on top. And I'll assign priority of the substituents. The OH is highest priority, number one. The hydrogen is lowest priority, highest and lowest atomic number, so number four. We have two other substituents, carbon substituent and another carbon substituent. The carbon substituent on top has carbon and two hydrogens attached to it. The carbon substituent on the bottom has an oxygen, a carbon, and a hydrogen. So oxygen trumps carbon. So this center, this one becomes two, this one becomes three. We're already conveniently citing down the bond to this hydrogen in the drawing, so I can just look and say, how do I go as I go one, two, three? And that's clockwise. So that tells us that we have an R stereocenter at the position of the star. And now we can try the same thing for the other atom, the other tetrahedral asymmetric center. <coughs> I'll put a star next to it just to remind us that there were, we're evaluating that one. One for the oxygen, two for this carbon, three for this carbon for the hydrogen. Again, we're citing down the bond to the hydrogen, so we very conveniently can go just draw our arrow here. Here we're doing counterclockwise, so this is S. So that sets us up to give, us, give ourselves 
assignments of all of the stereocenters in compound A. Compound A then becomes 1R 2S, and we always put those in parentheses, 1,2-cyclopentane diol. Compound B, since I flip things, we're going to see in a second that there's no difference between A and B. So, so this naming I'm doing in A and B in this one special case is arbitrary. But as we've gone through in the naming, I could name this 1S, 2R, 1, 2, cyclopentane diol. Now remember, compound C here has the same stereochemistry as A in the one position, but opposite stereochemistry in the two position. So compound C becomes 1R, 2R, 1, 2 cyclopentane diol. And finally, compound D, we flip both stereocenters, so compound D becomes 1S, 2S. between compound A, compound B, compound C, and compound D. So we're going to be able to compare all of these structures. So for those of you who've got a little bit of practice, you can just look at these drawings and perhaps without any, any additional help of any models, say, I can pick up this molecule, flip it over, and now the OHs are pointing out at us, and it's the same. How many people can see it that way? Great. Now, one of the reasons I use molecular models is because it's wonderful just for, for learning, for getting things from the two dimensions of the blackboard into the three dimensions of your mind. So we can do this in a couple of ways. Probably the easiest way is going to be with one, one molecular model. So I put on a molecular, I built a molecular model. Hopefully you can see it okay here against my shirt. The OHs are pointing out, so this is model A. And if I simply flip it over, the OHs are pointing back. Can you see that? So over, pointing out, flip back, they're pointing, pointing back. In other words, A and B are, are the same. image of A. So 
In the case of this way of drawing it, I've simply reflected through the plane of the blackboard to make a mirror image. You can make a mirror image in lots of different ways. If you prefer making a mirror image in a different way, you can say, here's A, here's my mirror plane. I can reflect through my mirror plane like so. And then if I simply rotate 180 degrees, so basically I've gone from this over to this, and now I'm going to rotate 180 degrees. We see that it's the same. Yet another way of looking at this is to simply say that the molecule A slash B, because it's the same molecule, has a mirror plane in it. These are all equivalent ways of looking at it, that the molecule A slash B has a plane of symmetry in it running through the molecule. In other words, I can reflect this part of the molecule, the bottom half of the molecule, into the top half. Thoughts or questions? <coughs>
or less superimpose the oxygens, the reds, and the oxygens here. But now you notice I have to hold it so that the five-membered rings don't superimpose. So this is the definition of non-superimposable mirror images. As I'm holding them now, you can see the mirror plane between molecule on the right and the molecule on the left. And yet we see that we can't superimpose them. These are non-superimposable images. So C and D are, by definition, what we call an antiverse. draw a definition, a distinction between A and B, there's one and the same molecule. But what's the relationship between molecule AB and molecule C?
tartaric acid. <laughs> Tartaric acid is a dihydroxy diacid. It's a molecule with two carboxylic acid groups. <clears throat> and where you have a hydroxy group, one off of each of the acid groups, alpha to them. And as I mentioned before, you may see the term alpha hydroxy acid on various skincare <coughs> products. That's just a fancy name for a variety of different carboxylic acids that have a hydroxy group one off of the carboxyl group. They're a little bit more acidic than a regular carboxylic acid. We saw this principle before. Why might they be a little more acidic than a regular carboxylic acid when you have an OH group on the carbon next to the carboxyl group? Resonance. There are two biggies that almost can get away with explaining all sorts of tread. One of them is resonance, where you have a direct direct electronic connection between the substituent and the group involved, the electrons. The other induction, that hydroxy group pulls electron density away from the carboxyl <coughs> group, making it more willing to give up a proton and get a negative charge. Tartaric acid is a little bit more acidic for that reason than a regular carboxylic acid. And also, as you saw in your homework problems, because dicarboxylic acids have extra effects for making the first hydroxy group more acidic, hydrogen bonding and the like for stabilizing the second hydroxy group. All right, tartaric acid is found in fruit, particularly in grapes. And the so-called natural isomer is quite abundant from plant sources, grapes and other fruits. So the 2R3R tartaric acid is the so-called natural isomer. And as you might imagine, anything that comes from grapes that go in big, grow in big bunches is dirt cheap. So it's five cents a gram if you go to buy it. Now, the 2S, 3S tartaric acid is often referred to as unnatural tartaric acid. The 2R3S 
is the same, it's equivalent to the 2s 3r tartaric acid This one is a meso compound, so it's the same type of pattern that we saw in cyclopentane diol, that when you're permuting all the stereocenters of a compound that's potentially symmetrical, you can get either a chiral compound, the enantiomer of the chiral compound, or an achiral meso compound. call this meso tartaric acid. This, this isomer, the meso one, really is unnatural. It has to be made synthetically in the laboratory, and it really is expensive. It costs $12 a gram. <coughs> I once engaged in a research project in asymmetric synthesis in trying to make chiral molecules from achiral molecules. So I started with mesotartaric acid to try to turn it either into the natural or the unnatural enantiomer. Talked about an experiment to convert gold into lead. $12 a gram to $5 a gram. All right. So I want to do in this acyclic example the same idea that we did in the cyclic example. What I'm going to do is I'm going to permute, I'm going to draw four, four permutations of tartaric acid. We're going to figure out which is which, and then we're going to look at the meso compound and figure out where the mirror plane is. How do we identify it as the meso compound? <coughs> All right. So, same idea. We're going to just draw out tartaric acid, four different structures, and permute stereochemistry of it. So I'll start by throwing the hydroxy groups out at us. So I have wedges to the hydroxy groups, and we'll call that structure A. I'll then go ahead and draw another structure where I have the hydroxy groups going back. And we'll call that structure B. Running out of room here. <coughs> I think I will double up. So I'll go back to the original stereochemistry. I'll flip this stereocenter, the one on the left. We have an OH coming out. And I'll leave the stereochemistry on the right alone. We'll have that one going back. I'll call this structure C. I'll write that off on the side here. And then I'll give us one last drawing. swap both stereo centers, so I'll have the one on the left going back and the run on the right coming out. And we'll call this structure G.
I want us to, just as we had done before, to assign the stereochemistry of the four centers. And so I'm going to go ahead, and just like we had done before, we'll look at one stereo center, and then we'll look at the other. So I'm starting with molecule A here. We're just going to do it for A, and we'll figure out everything on A. So, we're going to worry about this stereocenter. Now we have to come back to our conangle prelog rules and remember these subtleties of how we handle double bonds. So, the oxygen here is obviously the highest atomic number. It gets top priority. The hydrogen is obviously the lowest atomic number because we have a carbon atom with an oxygen, a hydrogen, and two carbons on it. So that's going to be number four. And now we have to deal with a competition between which is higher priority, the carboxyl carbon or the carbon bearing the hydroxy group. And the way we count the carboxyl carbon is we say pretend that the double bond is two single bonds. In other words, pretend that a double bond to an oxygen is equal to two single bonds to an oxygen. So this carbon counts as having three oxygen substituents on it, O, 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 whereas this carbon counts as having an oxygen substituent on it, a hydrogen substituent, which I haven't drawn, I guess I can draw it if you like, and another carbon and a carbon <coughs> substituent. So this substituent counts as O, C, H, and so O, O, O trumps O, C, H. So this carbon becomes number two, and this carbon becomes number three. And we're conveniently citing down the bond to, we're conveniently citing down this, this bond, so this becomes one, two, three. One, two, three, we're citing down the bond to the hydrogen. So this becomes R. So we'd say, since we're counting this as a two position, this is 2R. Questions or thoughts? Which is number one substituent or number one <coughs> numbering of the molecule? Yeah. The oxygen is number one. The carbon here is number two. And the carbon here is number three. The hydrogen is number four. This number two means it's in the two position on the chain. Here's how we number our tartaric acid chain. So two different issues here. One is the numbering that you see. The other is the numbering that you don't see. The numbering that you see is the numbers in the names of the molecule. And we number our alkyl chain, our dicarboxylic acid chain, one, two, three, four. This is why we call this molecule two, three, dihydroxy, butane, dioic acid is the other name for it. Two, three, dihydroxy. Butane dioic acid. So, those are the numbers we see that go into the name 2R, 3R. Then there are the numbers that we don't see. Then there are the numbers that we don't see, the ones that we just use for our private accounting of determining R and S. And the oxygen on the two position counts as number one. 
The carboxyl counts as number two. The carbon bearing and oxygen counts as number three. Make sense? All right. Let's do the same for the second stereocenter in the molecule. The so-called three position of the molecule. Here's our hydroxy group. I'm going to draw in the hydrogen here. So I'll put a little star here just to remind us that we're looking at this stereocenter. One for the oxygen, four for the hydrogen, two for the carboxyl, three for the carbon bearing the oxygen. So we were clockwise on the left, we're clockwise on the right, and so we are R here. So we are 3R. So compound A is 2R, 3R. I'll write that on the next blackboard.
The easiest way to see where the mesoplane is in tartaric acid is to perform a rotation, is to rotate the molecule. So here's our compound C slash D. Remember, C and D are one and the same. And what I'm going to do is imagine rotating about this central bond, like so. In other words, I'm putting my arm right where the bond is, because this is the way when you get good at this, you should be able to see this. And I'm going to rotate, pivot about it. Can you picture that? The OH is going back. When I rotate 180 degrees, that throws the OH forward. Also, that throws the carboxyl up here and the OH down here. Let me do the rotation on the blackboard, and then we're going to follow through with our molecular models. I've just done that rotation. Now the two OHs, you can see, I have them out. Here's our plane of symmetry. <clears throat> Let's try the same operation with molecular models. So I built, pre-built, the molecular model. And you notice on my molecular model, I had the hydrogen on your right coming out, the OH going back, the OH on the right coming out, the hydrogen coming back. I'm going to switch over to some video projection so you can see this big. So here we are. And I know we don't get a lot of depth perception. And so I'm going to rotate about that central bond. And now, you see the plane of symmetry right in the middle of the molecule, right over here. The OH is coming out, the OH is coming out, the hydrogens are going back, and we have a plane of symmetry. It's a little bit hard to see, to get the depth perception here with molecular models that are plastic. It works well on the blackboard screen. And, uh, it works well with the real molecular models, but not so well. Just the depth perception on the computer isn't so great. So I'm going to go ahead and give us some some plastic molec some uh, some computer-based molecular models here. I guess I only need to give us one. <coughs> All right, so here's our molecular model, and I'm going to make it better. I'm going to build, make it into um, maximum quality. And I'm going to go and show it as, show it as sticks. All right, so there's our, there's our model. I'll set the screen down. Make things a little bit bigger here. I think this is going to be it for, for what we're doing. And I'm just going to go ahead and perform this rotation in the editing mode. And we're going to go. Here we go. Here's our 
Here's our plane of symmetry right down the middle of the molecule. Don't worry about the rotations on the OH curves. And so that's what I was doing with my flashing model. All right, we're going to pick up next time.